Growing up gay in the Midwest and life on the campaign trail are just some of the topics Chastin Buttigieg, husband of Transportation Secretary Pete Buttigieg, covers in his book. I Have Something to Tell You, a memoir, is out in paperback today with a new preface, just in time for the start of Pride Month. It's published by Simon & Schuster, a division of Viacom CBS. And Chastin Buttigieg is with us now from his hometown of Traverse City, Michigan, to talk all about it. Thank you for joining us, um, Chastin. And we want to get back into the book, and I know you know the book came out a year ago, um, but I think it might be new to a lot of people as well. But before we do that, um, you were on the campaign trail. You write about being on the campaign trail. The book came out though before your husband was sworn as sworn in as transportation secretary, the first right. openly gay cabinet member um, to be sworn in. So here you are, a regular guy, um, and you are not just witnessing history, but you are part of history. Mm. I'm, I'm just wondering if, yeah. you know, it's in that moment, are you aware of of who and what you are and that you are being written into, into history? It was a strange year, to say the least, um, but there were many moments on the campaign trail when you realize just the weight, the severity of the race, what it meant to so many people in our community. There were often times I would meet folks who, you know, lost their friends, their communities, their churches, their jobs, simply because of who they were. Uh, and, and we would have these beautiful moments, uh, you know, hugging and tears. You know, I ran away from home when I was 18. I was terrified to face my family. Uh, and I met so many young people out on the campaign trail who had lived a very similar story, who were turned away from their homes. So while we were out on the race, I spent so many uh, so many hours, so much time with people who had lived very similar experiences uh, as mine. Um, and there were a lot of pinch me moments, you know, that this, this was a first um, and this was huge. This was a really big moment for our community and our country. You know what's so interesting to me, Chasten, uh, and you write about this in your book, is that for many, many years in Washington, many of the people making decisions for our lives um, were people who were of a different era. And I don't mean just, you know, um, people who are Gen X or or even baby boomers. I'm talking about some people who fought in World War II, who lived mm -hmm. in a, def a very different time and place in this country and have very different ideas about what it takes to to live a, a life where you can afford to have health care, you afford to send your kids to school and take a vacation mm -hmm. once in a while, right? So you write in right. the book about your struggles and your mom's struggle, for example, to afford health care, the student debt sure. that you took on, right? A guy or a woman or somebody who lived through the greatest generation period, they weren't worried about you know taking on student debt. They had the GI Bill um, and, right. and other and safety nets for them. Um, but you talk about this from the perspective of having lived through it, you and the secretary. Um, so why were, you, why were you so candid about them in your book? What were you hoping people would take away from that? Yeah, you know, out on the campaign trail for the first couple months when I joined uh, Pete out on the trail, I felt like I had to be very pent up um, you know, there's this idea in politics, it seems, that if you if you share your vulnerabilities, if you share your weaknesses, then you somehow are, are weak yourself. And it seems like folks in Washington and politics don't talk about those experiences. But then I I realized, you know, I just got to be myself out on the campaign trail. And, and people that resonated with folks when I opened up about sexual assault, when I opened up about coming out, when I opened up about student debt and medical debt. And then that helps other people feel seen. And more and more people, therefore, felt like they belonged, not only in a campaign, but in a country. And I think we need more of that in Washington, more people talking about their real lived experiences. And I agree with you. I think a lot of people look to people in positions of power and, and think, you know, I don't, I don't think you understand what it's like to walk in my shoes. Uh, I had many of those uh, you know, turkey dinner arguments uh, with family members about what it was like to work minimum wage and put yourself through college. And that's just not a reality anymore. Uh, and I think just like I do in the book, we a lot of us need to share our very personal stories so that other people uh, know that we understand what they're going through. And so included in that, you write about depression, you write about other mental health concerns that you dealt with uh, as you came out. You spent a lot of time in the, were in the Midwest trying to um, pretend to be someone else, trying to fit in in, in various different ways, and that had a, a toll on your mental health. Um, what did you yeah. learn 
um, during that time. And I know it, you pro probably during the, t living in that time, you're not thinking that you're learning anything, but now that you have some distance, what did you learn? And you wrote a very, very sort of approachable book. Uh, and I'm thinking it's because you want other people who were, who are in your position uh, the way you were back then when you're trying to figure everything out to be able to sort yes. of digest the book. And so what were you hoping um, that, that, you know, LGBTQ teens may be getting out of reading about your experiences? Yeah, you know, my goal for the book was folks pick it up and they feel like they're just grabbing a cup of coffee or a drink with me. I want it to be very candid. I want it to be very open because I want other people to know that they belong and they're not alone. That's why I dive into so many of those subjects in the book, because for a long time, I felt like nobody understood what I was going through, especially here in the Midwest, especially growing up in a pretty conservative small town. I want folks to pick up the book and read something where they say, oh, my gosh, that's me. Uh, and, I, and I just think that's really important, especially right now. We're talking about mental health. I know we're, we're here to celebrate Pride Month. We just wrapped up Mental Health Awareness Month. But there's a lot in the book, you know, about me feeling alone and depressed um, and feeling like I was on the outside of exclusion. And I want young people especially to pick up this book and see that, wow, somebody has been through this. Somebody understands what I'm going through. And I think that's really important as we move into Pride Month that we as allies show up for one another and make space for other people to feel seen and know that they belong. Yeah, and I, I want to dig a little more into um, what you hope young people take away from your book and your experiences, you and Secretary Buttigieg, um, because all too often what happens when you are the first when, whether it's somebody, whether it's, it's race or ethnicity or, or gender um, or sexual orientation, you know, it's hard for people to, some young people especially, to see themselves, even though you and Secretary Buttigieg are, are, are young. But, you know, if I was 12, you would still be old to me, right? You would still be somebody <laughs> who I don't like, right. I would think. Like, it's funny now as somebody who's in his, you know, 50s to think that I feel young and I, I think I am young. But when I was, you know, 10, somebody who was 30 and let alone 50 seemed like ancient to me. And, and I wonder, um, when yeah. we talk to young people about holding on, about life getting better, or um, the, the, the people that they interact with coming to grips to the reality of who they are. What can you say to them now from where you are? I mean, in other words, because what, what happens is when people get to the pinnacle, they, there is a tendency to forget some of the things that actually led right. you to this period or this point in your life. So what do you say to people from where you are right now about what it's like where you are? In other words, it's not a big deal. Like the fact that you're in, in Washington and where well, you mean right now you're in, in Michigan, but you know, the fact that you yeah. and Pete are in, in Washington DC and moving at the highest levels of power in American government, like people are seem okay with it. Yeah, you know, when I was younger and especially when I came out, a lot of people like to say it gets better, but when you're going through it, right, when you feel like the mud is up to your shoulders and you just can't push anymore, people would say, well, it gets better. And that just sounds, it, it just sounds like a crap, right? When mm -hmm. you're younger and you're going through it. And I remember being out on the campaign trail and meeting with these young people having round tables talking about my experience. And some of them would look at you like, you have no idea what it's like mm -hmm. to be in my shoes, which is also true. I only have a, you know, a certain type of experience. I don't know what it's like to be every single person in this community, but I do know the importance of showing up and making space for other people in this community. And that's what got me through it. It wasn't necessarily that, you know, our country progressed rapidly, because arguably it still hasn't when it comes to LGBTQ rights, but it was friends, it was family um, that made space for me, that, that verbally said, I love you and I want you to survive this. I'm going to make space for you and I'll be here for you. And so I guess not only for the young people listening, but for, for other people who are listening, maybe parents uh, or teachers who consider themselves allies, allyship is a verb. You have to show up for people mm. and physically make space and verbally say, this is a safe space where you belong. Because when I was going through it, I felt so alone. I felt like nobody in my life cared and nobody in my life understood until I had a friend say, you know, I feel like you might be going through something. And I just want to let you know I love you and I'm here for you. And that's the most important thing that we can do, especially uh, for folks who are coming out uh, or, or going through something um, as allies. 
Jason, that's exactly actually the question that I was going to ask you because in sort of your previous answer, you you describe yourself as an ally, which you are. But we often think of allies as people who are also not part of the community, mm. you know. And mm -hmm. and I heard you talk in a podcast a little bit about um, acknowledging that while you're part of the LGBTQ community, you also have privilege, and mm -hmm. sort of taking that into account. And, and being able to use that privilege to improve other people's lives. Um, being an ally, I think, has become quite complicated for people now. Um, you know, people uh, want you to use they or her or he or, you know, the, 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 what, what are the pronouns and which alphabet or what letter are you part of within LGBTQ plus? Um, and I think that people get overwhelmed and don't know exactly how to show support the, to the community. But it sounds like you're saying, make space, give yeah. love, and that goes a long way. Yeah, and acknowledge that you're going to mess up. Messing up is uncomfortable, and we don't want to mess up, especially if you consider yourself an ally. And some of these things are new. You know, we live in a very heteronormative society, so of course pronouns are going to seem a little off-putting to someone who's only done it a certain way for 50, 60, 70 years. But it's, it's a very, very simple thing to do to help somebody feel included. But you might mess up. And to be honest, I've messed up before too. As a teacher, you know, I want to make sure I'm making the safest space possible in my classroom, but I have messed up. And the most important thing to do is when you mess up, apologize, quickly restate the proper pronoun and move on from there. And always ask questions. If you consider yourself an ally, just ask questions. How can I be supportive? How can I be more helpful? How can I make sure that you know this is a safe space where you belong? And you know, we're, we're changing, it's a changing country and that's for the better. I know people that can be off-putting, but it's not that we all just suddenly arrive that there are more letters in the acronym. It's because a lot of people in this country never felt safe enough to even belong in that acronym and in this country. And now is our job as allies to make sure that everyone in that acronym feels like they belong. Chasten, it's such a beautiful sentiment. I, but I know you got to run, but I just have one last question mm -hmm. because it's something that Anne-Marie said sure. that I find really intriguing. Um, the recognition that you, even having faced some of the challenges that you talk about, that you write about in your book, do have certain privileges that not everybody has. Yes. How have you found in just your outreach and talking to people um, that you are able to reach across these divides that, um, for example, if you're talking to somebody who's, who's, who's black and gay and come Comes from an underserved community, or a migrant, um, or somebody. You know, I'm just trying to. I'm trying to get from you if mm -hmm. you found that when you do provide your allyship to them, that can reach across these these sort of nebulous things that you may not have in common, but your humanity. You have that shared humanity and that caring and that loving that you're that you're extending to that person will bridge those divides, whatever they may be. Sure. I think, you know, if you belong to the LGBTQ community, I think for most people at some point in your life, you have been on the outside of inclusion. Um, but, you know, I, as a white cisgender man, only have a certain experience um, that is probably and most certainly rapidly different um, than, than folks, uh, for example, who are in our community of color. So allyship isn't just like slapping a rainbow sticker on your backpack or your water bottle and kind of, you know, signaling <laughs> to folks like, hey, I might be part of the community or I'm an ally. Part of your job as an ally is also to do the work. You know, I've been enjoying a podcast called Being Seen, which is uh, just about uh, the black gay experience because I just want to learn, I want to listen, and I want to know what other people in our community are going through because that makes me a better ally uh, and a better friend. Uh, so I think part of the allyship is yes, kind of showing up. You know, up here in Michigan, we have these beautiful up north pride signs. I love seeing my neighbors put them out in the yards. Um, but I also have to do the work myself. Um, that way, when you do come to the table to have those conversations, you have a little bit more understanding what someone has gone through. But I think it's also important to ask those questions and have those conversations because all of our experiences and our existences are very different. It's such an important point. I mean, and I love what you say that, do the work, because I think that that is often what is failing. We were just talking about this in the context of the Tulsa race massacre. You know, people mm -hmm. will slap a rainbow sticker or a BLM sticker or put, you know, BLM in their Twitter handles and that's it. <laughs> you know, that, right. that's the extent of what they do. And when they are when they are confronted with 
some of those biases that they may have, they may not even be aware of, they immediately point to the sticker or to the bumper sticker right. and say, but hey, I'm, I'm with you. But you're really right. not because you're not yeah. even willing to make the minimum to understand where somebody's coming from. Yeah, we have to have those uncomfortable conversations, especially with folks, you know, even in our own friend groups or our families, you know, where someone might say something. And I know being part of the community can be exhausting when you feel like you're constantly fighting for your own, you know, visibility, uh, your own civil rights. Um, but sometimes when you hear somebody say something, you know, if they make fun of pronouns, uh, you know, or they say all lives matter, you got to stop them. And you have to have that uncomfortable conversation. And part of doing that work is swallowing your pride a little bit, you know, cracking your knuckles and saying, all right, we're, we're going to have to do this because people's lives depend on it. Some people might consider themselves an ally, but they also need to do the work, too. Uh, this has been such an illuminating conversation. Uh, Chastin Buttigieg, thank you very, very much for spending some time with us. We really appreciate it. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. So I have something to tell you is uh, sorry. I have something to tell you. A memoir is available right now in bookstores across the country. You can get it online, too.